Good afternoon and welcome to 1374, a short lecture regarding what we gone through in 1373. I will continue my read where I left off and we are presently in the one, two, three, fourth paragraph just ended with Heidegger's famously what is present and according to philosopher Carol Bigwood While Heideggerian, being is not a being, neither it is a God or an absolute unconditional ground, but is simply the living web within which all relations emerge. That is to say, being constitutes the dimension of dynamic life process. The life world dimension From this we can conclude that light, or more generally, electromagnetism, indeed comprises a non-classical dimension unto itself. an entire world of intimate subject-object interaction. Thus light as such as opposed to that which is merely is lit light as quantized Kleinian action That is Epsilon H hat is the paradoxical phenomenon that gives physical significance to Melopontis dimension of depth. Now, the thought experiment illustrating the app 
perspective nature of light implicit in the Michelson Morley research brings to mind our perceptual experiment with a neck cube. Ordinarily, we perceive one perspective of the cube at a time. And in shifting from one perspective to the other, We observe the kind of difference we would expect to see in changing the angle from which we view an object. The faces of the cube that appeared inside before the shift now appear outside and vice versa. As we had moved around a solid object and were viewing it from a different angle. One that had changed the visibility of its surfaces. Concealing some, uncovering others. The concealed surfaces of the solid object correspond to the interior faces of the Necker cube. And the visible surfaces of the solid correspond to the exterior faces of the cube. But with the integration of the cube, perspectives are superposed upon each other. In penetrating one another, each perspective encompasses the whole cube so that the integrated cube can be said to penetrate itself. Here we see the two takes of the neck cube going into each other. Of course, there is the limitation of macroscopic perception noted in the previous section.
though the cube's perspectives are superposed to give a one-sided experience that can symbolize the integration of subject and object found in the depth dimensional phenomenon of light. The cube appears before us as but an object in space. Clearly then, the classical formula holds sway in relation to the large-scale external world. Here, the self-penetration of the integrated cube does not literally penetrate the one who views it. Here, the observer does not draw back in upon herself to observe her own observing, uniting observer and observed in the process. Quantum physics tells us that it is in the submicroscopic realm where such a union can take place. This is where, in viewing the particle of light, one must view one's own viewing in a reflexive act of self-penetration as we will soon see. The difference between observing the submicroscopic photon and viewing larger scale phenomena applies not only to the Necke cube but to McClintock's chromosomes as well. Like the cube, the chromosome appears before the observer as an entity in ordinary space. The chromosome is thus objectifiable whereas the photon is not. This difference is 
ontological. We were lucky there, just in a single or couple of paragraphs, everything became very interesting indeed. The two different takes of the Necky Cube are interpenetrating each other, thereby making meaning stronger and clearer. The reality comes from the many perspectives and it is something that rises, becomes more and more. It is never the case of a binary true or false or real versus unreal. Those aspects are similar to the detached subject and object. There are no zeros and ones here. Everything is more complex. The interpenetration of the Necky cube is similar to having different understanding of what is said. We mention words at the end of the last lecture and I come to think of once more the very good, the voice of the friend. By separating the friend from our experience, by putting transcendental definition of it, From whom is it? How does the voice tell? What does the words mean? This sounds very close to the left hemisphere, wanting to understand, hear the meaning. What does it mean? It constantly asks. of objects themselves, what is this? How can it be defined? What is its measurable aspects? How can I isolate it from the exteriority that it is placed in, in the space and as well most important how can I isolate it from myself where I am my constitution we discussed the other day the famed physiotherapist or body educator Frederick Matthias Alexander and he wrote already before the Great War that there is a change in bodily attitude that changes how we see the world. I think What he saw was the coming of something which is today standard, that we try to embody disjunct subjects. We really try hard to be brain in the that, no longer corporal, 
and thereby we are causing harm to experience itself. It becomes stale, it becomes repetitive. I think looking at an object, the modern way of seeing is just the surface. There is no depth. They are blank tokens for the reality. Representations. And as representations, they are no longer of this world. They are movable by fiat of randomness, almost like the playthings in Monopoly. The hat, the cane, the car, we never look at those things. Why not? Well, it is not in how they look they serve a purpose in the Monopoly. They are automat automatic. The very figure of Monopoly, the gentleman with a high hat, a couple of years ago, someone asked me, does that rich man, presumably rich, does he wear a monocle on his eye? And, of course, I said yes. It turned out there is no monocle to be seen. And apparently, the common conception in 80% of cases is that he carries a monocle. This is an example of representation. We are not in the presencing we are using tokens for reality in our body, in our minds, very close to Betty Edwards drawing on the right hand, right side of the brain, where she shows that when she asks adults to draw, they just draw symbols, not reality. Symbols that been going around in their minds since they were pre-adolescent, since the time of nine, ten. And oddly enough, it seems today that by the age of nine and ten, progression in understanding stops slowly halts. This is a common problem within education and there might just be a very important connection here. Let's see, I'm gonna turn the camera to my colleague Kalle here for some comment. Hello, hello, hello. I would like to repeat one phrase in Rose's paper. The chromosome is objectifiable, whereas the photon is not. So the chromosome, we could say, is the DNA, DNA or the, uh, the DNA or the cell. Uh, and it's true that you can objectify it, so to say, uh, that you do much research, you, uh, you isolate the cell, like in the Heidegger and terms of and you look it from the distance, but you forget uh, the frame, that is the surroundings. Uh, so you can objectify the cell or the DNA uh, by isolating it from the surroundings, but it comes to life only to get at the surroundings. Yes, thus it's possible to objectify the chromosome or the cell or the DNA, but we shouldn't do it, uh, of course. Uh, and and um, uh, Rose says also the photon is not objectifiable, and he is completely right. 
uh, photon we could say it's the light you cannot objectify it as we do it it's easy to say that the light like the light the light part is here uh, it's not here uh, it's not here because it's at the same instant it's already in my eyes so the light is okay we could say it's in two places at the same time it's in my eyes uh, so that's my comment thank you thank you so much thank you very much Carla for that comment I was thinking there might be a connection here to the modern idea of understanding using uh, the object of a lamp once more today if we want to understand something we need not only to isolate it but we also want to put extra light on it to put it on under the clearer vision of a fluorescent lamp or the sharp lamp of the surgeon in the hospital the idea that you put more light on what you want to understand gives clearer understanding parallel to that could be the idea so common today within the educational system is to have extra definitions repetitions things that serve almost like measuring rods meters to zoom in on the understanding to make it clearer to isolate and make it even more distant going in the opposite direction from entering into the object going into the direction of distance far from not inside and assuming that detached cold mechanical posture and in the end using yourself your body in a mechanical hard way that lacks the living body's smooth eloquent careful demeanor in this harshness things becomes overly distinct this is the black and white thinking no shades anymore no properties to the space that surrounds nothing blurred the ever stronger and stronger light takes away the living object the thing you want to understand I like the Gil Christian word here understand in it's a way of standing put that in contrast with the grasping grasping 
grasping is by itself a strain on the mind. It carries friction. It takes energy to think. You need to move about dense, impenetrable objects to make your coarse, linear conclusions. Ava evading the intimacy that could be the possibility. I will read a little bit more. It was Heidegger who emphasized the importance of what he called the ontological difference. The crucial distinction is that between the ontical and the ontological. Although Heidegger himself provided no explicit definitions of these terms, his translators did. Ontological inquiry is concerned primarily with being. Ontical inquiry is concerned primarily with entities and the facts about them. According to philosopher David Michael Levin, why this fundamental difference between being and beings is both basic and simple. Its articulation and understanding are matters of greatest difficulty. Levin proposes a fruitful way of formulating the ontological difference is to articulate it as the difference between the horizon field or clearing within which beings appear 
and the various beings themselves. or as the difference between the ground of significance itself and the figures which appear in its setting and stand out from the ground Being is not a being. But rather the dimensionality within which all beings are to be encountered. End of quote there from Levin. The ontological difference can be clarified further by recognizing that if being is a dimensional context or background, it cannot be so in the same sense that classical space serves as a background. For being is not just the ground from which figures stand out. It is not merely that which functions as a framework or container of objects. Rather, the objects and the spatial background emerge from being along with the detached subject who reflects upon those objects in other words what stands out from being? What being opens up and first makes possible is object in space before subject. Here we can clearly see that the for beings, there is being. The before from which all 
the merge. That before that carries all significance. The why Swiftly we passed earlier from something that we termed archiperception or archaic foundation the beforeness that construct after and before. It is before time. It is before the individual subject and the detached object in front of us. From here, all stems. This is the true origin. I think about the poem, The Wanderer by Hördelin. On the path to his family home. His lust when he approaches on the mountain, getting memories, ideas, longings, Those are the things that makes the experience real. His wants, his wishes are what lights experience. This is in contrast to the detached non-wanting, non-wishing idea that especially Jacques Monod expressed when he said the scientist needs to be detached. He or she needs to isolate, not participate, not having a lust like the wanderer, having no inclination, no internal hopes, feelings, strivings, According to Jacques Monod, experience as a scientist is only possible 
if these premises are met. It's a bit that if you are preparing something in a laboratory, a specimen, a bacterial culture to be grown, if you put your finger in it, you will contaminate it. you will make the results no longer objective. They will be tainted, skewed. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, the strongest idea of the detached scientist came after the Second War. Where people who were already disembodied already fostered in an ambience that motivated isolation, detachment, distance. Jacques Monod is maybe the clearest examples of these modern scientists. They do not only say that being discompassionate will make the results better. They mean it's an absolute prerequisite for science. To cut out that part of oneself that is the contaminating finger in experience, the self. And getting used to the conception that that is really possible, thereby really contaminating experience by not going to the real before source. You lose out on the world and of the world.
instead of more experience, experience become dimmed out. Unclear and uninformative. And of course, utterly unsatisfactory. It will not give sustenance for your knowing self. So rather than the metaphor of not contaminating, scientist of modern era are cutting off the branch they are sitting on and simple-mindedly thinking that is going to make the thing better. Rosen has shown the absolute opposite would be the case. A nullification, if to use a Rudolf Gachet word, everything becomes polarized and when the two different polarization meet each other zero or nothing remains a nullified understanding that was my summary and hereby I end the lecture have a very nice afternoon and thank you very much still clouded i think this industrial building is a nice depiction of jacques monod's soul baron bye